Hello, Luke Freeman. Uh, hi, you are the executive director of Giving What We Can. That is correct. Um, yes, I'm the executive director of Giving What We Can. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. That's the second time I have fucked up somebody's business name in the last three podcasts. So I'm doing well. I've almost got the bingo. Uh, what do you guys do? What, what, what exactly does your, uh, does your role entail? Yeah, so Giving What We Can... Um, is a community of effective givers. So as an organization, uh, we try and, and try to inspire people to give more and to give more effectively. And as a community, we're people who are trying to act uh, on the best information that we can uh, to give to, to donate to some of the world's most outstanding uh, charities. So we try and use evidence and reason to find outstanding giving opportunities to help others. Um, yeah, so that's the organization. And this is pretty important because when I look at Oftentimes, like I'm pretty skeptical of charities because oftentimes when you uh, when you look at one, it turns out they have like 60 percent administration fees, whatever that means. Um, and so your dollar actually isn't going as far as you would like it to go. Yeah. And look, it's it's reasonable to be skeptical um, because charities don't have the same uh, link between the donor and the um you know, beneficiary uh, as you would with, say, an economic transaction where if you go to buy a coffee and it's $5 or if it's $5,000, you're going to notice that. Um, but if you just say, I want to give $5, uh, you don't know if that's buying one coffee or one th one thousandth of a coffee. Mm. Um, what you mentioned, though, before is uh, something that people often think about when they think of charity effectiveness, which is overheads or administrative costs. But that is actually, uh, while important, it's actually one of the often least important and most focused on parts of charity ineffectiveness is oh what do they spend on you know office their office and their staff and their yeah, advertising or anything like that when often the biggest differences and the really like the orders of magnitude differences you get uh, on the interventions that the charities are pursuing so for example if you're trying to you know help uh improve someone's you know, help someone who's blind you could give them a cataract surgery or you could help uh, you know, provide a guide dog um, and the difference between that you know helping someone versus restoring sight the cost can be you know at least a uh, you know, hundred times difference uh, depending on who in the world you're helping with that problem and, and how you're helping them similarly you know if you're trying to help animals uh, you could be helping animals uh, that are being rescued or you could uh, in you know domestic dogs and cats or you could be helping farmed animals and farmed animals are just so neglected and the problems are you know so solvable <laughs> relatively speaking um, that you just get these huge returns on investment by changing the interventions that you're looking at most of the time. That's a good point what you initially said about advertisement because obviously <laughs> if I was advertising I would be getting a return on my dollar that is more than one dollar per dollar so yeah. I might be getting two dollars for every one dollar I spend so actually spending money on advertising isn't something I should say uh, I'm not donating to these people because they advertise yeah. that would be silly. Um, but yeah, that's, Go on. that's like a donation multiplier in a sense. You are now enabling them to not just do more work, but to find more donors. Mm, yeah. Um, Obviously that tapers off though. If like a charity just spends 99% you know, of its resources on advertising, it would be very hard for that 1% to be making a huge difference in the world. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit of a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and you guys use... Uh, use like it sounds like you use an effective altruism model is that correct yeah so giving what we can is actually a um, founding organization within the effective altruism movement which looks at how can we use our resources to the, to do the most good specifically looking in the charitable sector and the kind of rest of the effective altruism field looks at other things like careers or advocacy and things like that so Give Me What We Can was founded in 2009 by two Oxford philosophers, Toby Ord and Will McCaskill. Um, and uh, around 2011, another organization, 80,000 Hours, was founded to help people you know, do the most good with their careers. And uh, the two organizations created the charity, uh, the Center for Effective Altruism, as the kind of uh, back end uh, back office for both organizations. And, uh, and since then, the term effective altruism has kind of grown from there. Yeah. What would you say is the central tenet of effective altruism? Uh, more than anything, it's a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is a question of how can we use whichever resources we're trying to apply to solving world problems most effectively. Mm. So you might say, look, I want to give this amount of money and I want to improve welfare of humans in the near term. Uh, so 
how might I do that? And then you might go, well, uh, there is a lot of scientific evidence around certain interventions. You know that there are really big problems that you can uh, apply that and they're not getting a lot of funding. And you might know what a cost you know, per year of life saved might be. And there are other things you might look at, like you know, risk reduction uh, for things like pandemics, or you might look at uh, chances of changing uh, welfare for lots of people in, in policy types of interventions. But it's generally looking at, if I'm going to focus some career or money or advocacy, how might I get the best return for the amount of time or money that I'm allocating to this? I love the metrics you're using, like year of life saved or like percentage of like chance of reduced risk. Yeah. That's really excellent. Um, yeah, well, it's part of articulating what are your goals? Like when you're doing something in the world, um, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, mm -hmm. And that is the first step in trying to get better at achieving it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, effective altruism. Actually, 80,000 hours has is, is been really interesting to me because I guess yeah. their central tenant is, I haven't read the book, but as far as I understand, it's something like, um, what are you going to do with the, the career that you pick? And a lot of times, uh, and this is kind of, I think a lot of people could use this advice. Uh, the advice is like, do whatever you love to do, whatever you're like the best at doing, whatever you love doing, just do that. Because if you are like a physicist, but you think mm -hmm. environmentalism is a real problem, do physics. And then excel at it, but then put your money towards an environmental charity. Yeah, in some cases it might be uh, something like that, um, where it would, and that's kind of called earning to give, uh, especially if you are able to take your know, more higher paying role. So I've seen people go into things like quantitative trading from something like physics uh, because they feel that they could you know, put that money towards solving things mm -hmm. that they care about. Um, but it's also about you know, what you can do with your career uh, within parts that make sense that have good personal fit. So for example, if you're a physicist and you really care about climate change, well, there may be really re relevant research that is uh, really neglected within climate change that could relate to the skills as a physicist as well. Yeah. And so uh, there's this combination of what resource you can apply, time and money are the two big ones that we generally think about, but there's also things like social and political capital that you know, can be incredibly effective to apply. But um, time and money can be traded off against each other more than something like social capital. <laughs> so, um, you know, but e even as a physicist, you know, you see there are some incredible things that they use, you know, social and political capital following the atomic bomb development. You know, a lot of nuclear physicists were early in deproliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, so they used their clout in that sense as well. And that's probably the most impactful thing they could have done. Yeah, that's a good point. Hmm. Yeah. What, uh, what charities do you guys focus on mostly? So yeah. you are, you're kind of a meta charity, right? So yeah. I might give to you and then you give to the best charities. Yeah, um, or even we provide information and advice around how people might give directly to those charities or they can give via us as well. Um, we uh, generally focus on kind of three main worldviews, and that is, you know, things that help people now um, or in their near term. Uh, and that's generally going to be uh, in, the, you get the biggest bang for your buck uh, by helping people who aren't in rich countries. Um, because uh, there is really, really strong uh, interventions that you can do that would be massively beneficial. If you just think about, even, even if you were just giving cash, which is you know, sometimes quite an effective thing to do, uh, the difference in, in improvement in people's life that cash makes in a rich country is so, so small compared to a poor, poor country. Mm -hmm. Then you magnify that by actually applying that cash to, you know, blanket interventions that can help an entire region, something like eradicating malaria from that region or, you know, uh, intestinal worms. Like you just get these incredible, um, incredible abilities to improve lives with things that are so commonplace, um, you know, and kind of solved in rich countries that, you know, it feels they're just kind of, we forget that they still exist in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of really privileged without even realizing that, you know, we're not having to combat things like malaria in our everyday lives. And in rich countries, there are also some neglected things as well, uh, typically things that have either stigma or a underrepresented population. Uh, that we're, So you find things like mental health or um, uh, segments of the population who don't have the ability to vote or don't have a strong voting bloc. Their, their needs are going to be neglected relative to uh, things that you would get through government or other sources as well. And then the other two worldviews is, do you include the lives of animals in, in the lives that you're caring for? If you do, 
well, there's a huge amount of suffering that's unnecessary um, that we can do a lot to prevent within uh, animal welfare and particularly factory farming, but also to some extent in uh, the looking at wild animals uh, through the lens of welfare instead of uh, traditionally looking at it through environmentalism. Um, yeah. So, you know, our impact on animals uh, and also animals' you know, uh, lives, if you're including them in your moral circle, there's a lot of suffering that you could prevent. Um, and the third kind of major worldview that people look at is do you also include future lives? And so the reason that we often care about things like climate change is not just because of the impacts that we're going to see in our lifetime, but these are things that are going to affect many generations to come. Mm. And the most significant of those things are things that could cease, uh, you know, to human life or the kind of experiencing life. Um, so extinction level events or things that kind of have lock-in effects. So, um, you know, emerging technologies that could really you know, change things like artificial uh, intelligence or biotechnology, um, you know, imagine how much worse uh, viruses could be than what we're seeing with COVID mm -hmm. um, if they were more infectious and um, and more fatal. And if you kind of, with the em emerging biotechnology, you could engineer viruses that would be, just be dev devastating um, and even just accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> so like there are these things that could be really, really huge in scale. The thing about preventing future issues is that you don't get thanked for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There was the guy who, who was the father of genetic engineering or something. I forget his name. Yeah. But he, he made it possible to uh, create so much more food in underdeveloped nations. And mm. he's probably saved millions of lives. But nobody knows his name. Like, I don't even remember his name. I'm talking yeah. about him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there was a green revolution. And um, was it Norman uh, something? Yeah. I, I can't remember his name. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like, there's just these... Uh, yeah, incredible things that that happen at points in history that often people forget forgotten. Um, one that I often think of is Stanislav Petrov, who was a um, a, a Russian uh, military person who was had this opportunity. Like, he's, if he'd followed orders, he would have uh, set in motion a nuclear uh, war. <laughs> and because uh, yeah, the early warning system went up saying that the Americans are bombing us, we should, you know, mutually short distraction, we should bomb them back. And uh, there was an error in the system. It wasn't actually uh, nukes coming towards Russia, but he disobeyed the protocol and ref and didn't report uh, what he was seeing and, and which would have prevented nuclear war. And like, um, there are he he was forgotten to history. In fact, he was you know chastised for not doing following <laughs> you know protocol. Um, and then you know only decades later was it you know found out that he many of us probably owe our lives to him and him thinking about the consequences of his actions. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> wow, he's probably saved millions and millions of lives. Because if if the Russians had bombed the U.S. We wouldn't have just stopped and let them bomb us either. It would have been like a back and like a oh trading yeah trading back and forth. It would. And we're at the point where that that could have that could have ended it for everyone. That yeah. billions alive and potentially billions or tr trillions that could come after us as well. Um, you mentioned before about wild animal welfare. So, what do you mean by treating wild animals from a welfare perspective instead of from an environmentalist perspective? Yeah. So a lot of the time. Um, you know, part of, as I said, part of this process is thinking about what your goals are. Um, what are you trying to do when you're giving to charity or, you know, using your career? And a lot of the time, I, and I used to say this, I would say, um, you know, I'm an environmentalist. I care about the environment. And it'll be like, well, why? Why do I care about the environment? And when I looked at it, I go, well, I care about it because it is the home for us and for animals and uh when I actually reflect on it, it's a, it's a welfare perspective. Like I don't care if there is an, a planet with an environment, you know, an environment could be a rocky desert. Like, you know, there is nothing intrinsically valuable to me other than aesthetic uh, value um, about an environment as it's nearly as important as the welfare of those that are in the environment. Uh, so it's the home of, humans and animals and some of them are wild and some of them are you know farmed if you look at this uh, from a bigger picture and 
some some people care about like the number of species or something like that and that's a conservationist um mentality and, and if you're thinking about welfare well then that's a different lens um so are we is it not necessarily the number of lives that there are of any particular species uh but are those lives good? Like, are we poisoning or removing environment and creating harm? Mm. Ultimately, I don't like the environments change over time. Um, and sometimes they're more conducive to good life and sometimes they're not. Um, like a rainforest is full of a lot of life and a desert is not full of a lot of life. Um, it gets pretty complicated once you actually start to think about wild animal welfare. It's a very, very new field because there are huge questions around well, do insects feel pain, for example? Um, and uh, what is that pain? What is the moral relevance of that pain if, or, or that experience? Um, and how would you know, you know, if it's, uh, you know, if they're conscious of it, if, like you know, all, all those types of things? Because um, if you do care about welfare, um, then you know, the fact that insects breed at this kind of crazy rate and just kind of die very quickly, that's, that could be quite a, quite a big thing to deal with, but it's a very early field. It's not something that we're nearly at a point of, you know, being able to make a lot of sense out of, but, it, but, and, but it's an important question to be asking if you, if you care about welfare, um, to actually go, well, you know, what do we even mean by welfare and who, who's included in that? And then what are their lives like? And, you know, how do we know? It seems almost impossible. Like, how many chickens is worth? How many chicken lives is is worth yeah. a human life? Like, how are chickens? Do they have the mm. same relevance as cows in terms of life, or mm. are insects the same as mammals? Like, how do you tell? Yeah, and I think the the problem is what we most of the time do is we rely on our moral intuitions, which are really, really good in certain contexts, like how we should be treating the people around us, because that's what they're evolved to do. Um, but if we abstract morality to a higher level of kind of more philosophical and reasoned thinking about, well, just because, for example, I'm, I'm going to feel more empathy to someone who looks like me isn't a philosophically sound reason to treat people who look like me better than people who don't look like me or people whose accents sound the same as me. Like th these are the intuitive thing uh, from a moral perspective is we, we do, we actually, it's very human. It's very tribal and human to treat people who sound and look like us better than those who don't. And that's, we've seen huge problems with things like racism and sexism and classism and like all of this thing comes from this kind of intuitive response. So if we, challenge those intuitive responses then we have to have reasoned reasons for doing things mm. um and and once you open up that can of worms you, you need to think carefully about what you mean um and so if you are included you know you've got a uh, dog for example you're walking down the street and someone's kicking your dog most of us would go that is terrible you know that dog is suffering that person is terrible for doing that i would intervene um, similarly, if you saw them doing it to a kangaroo, which is a wild animal, um, and is it bad because it's a human doing the action, or is it bad because um, if you saw a dog uh, tearing apart a kangaroo on the street, like you, know, mm. would you also want to intervene and also think that that's bad? Mm. So, because you're caring about the experience of that animal, um, and that's the kind of suffering and flourishing lens of uh, looking at that, looking at welfare. Mm. Well, it's interesting because obviously if I see a lion in a nature documentary tearing apart mm. a gazelle, I don't, I, mean, I, I guess I do think poor gazelle, but I don't think mm. somebody should have intervened. What yeah. are we doing? Um, yeah, and, and the question is, are there are, you know, side constraints around intervention? Um, but uh, dealing with these questions is really important as opposed to just assuming that we've kind of our intuitions are right. <laughs> There, there is, I, I think you mentioned how we, we kind of preference people with our accent or, or who look yeah. like us, but I wonder if there is a case for nationalism, like uh, mm -hmm. supporting Australian charities before supporting overseas charities. I mean, this is one I've heard from other people. I'm, I'm not sure, really sure what to think of it, but if we, for instance, deal with something like wealth inequality, then our own nation becomes more stable and then we are more able to give in the future. 
Um, yeah, a lot of these are empirical questions. So I think is the, the difference between the empirical and the ph philosophical. So nationalism, uh, to some extent, may be justified empirically um, mm -hmm. when it isn't philosophically. And uh, therefore, the philosophical pragmatist, you know, it, it would then justify it if that's the empirical you know, best solution. <laughs> so, for example, you might say um, open borders philosophically may be much more justifiable to say, hey, just because someone is born somewhere doesn't mean that their welfare is any less good, mm -hmm. like, less morally important, and um, that and their welfare is improved if they immigrate to a place that has uh, is a higher income country. And generally that country's uh, GDP and, and welfare increases as well. There's a lot of research on that. The problem is that may have empirical limits. Uh, and, and you've seen that with things like uh, the UK and, and Germany with a backlash to um, immigration happening too fast may then uh, increase violence towards immigrants or, uh, or, you know, or make it harder to have more immigration in the future or anything like that. So it's not, there's a difference between what's the empirical ground truth um, and what's a like utopian philosophical ground truth. And then how do you factor in the reality into what your ultimate goals might be? So you mm -hmm. might be like nationalistic, uh, like believe that it's okay to have a nation state and, and a useful thing to have a nation state um, for some of these practical reasons. Um, but still not think that someone's life is any less valuable because they happen to be on the other side of the side of a border. Yeah, uh, that, that definitely makes sense. I was trying to figure out how to, I mean, I was trying to figure out at that point, why mm. would you even have a philosophical standpoint if it doesn't make sense in reality? Mm. But I suppose uh, valuing other people's lives and also understanding that maybe a nation is a more secure way to run the world like nations mm. separated into different places is, is a secure way to run the world right now but we should also prioritize other people's lives yeah that makes sense yeah and so a lot of the time people aren't coming from a, a enlightened um prag kind of pragmatic view mm. a lot of the time we are responding on our intuitions uh which is oh i feel that Australians, I should be prioritizing Australians because I'm in Australia. Mm. Um, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily come from a place of, I've done deep reflection about this. And I have to admit this to myself all the time that I, my intuitive response to things, uh, when you're dealing with big issues that our evolved brains weren't <laughs> built for <laughs> like those intuitions are going to be something that are a bit sketchier and you need to really question that yeah and I mean for you must be someone who cares so much and I wonder how you deal with uh the fact that there's an endless amount of problems in the world like the universe doesn't stop giving us problems they yeah. just keep coming there's, yeah. an, there's the environment there's there's poverty there's malaria yeah. anything I mean whatever you want how do yeah. you deal with that well I think the the most um the most kind of emotionally sustainable thing to do is to focus on the positive is to go uh, you know to see problems as an opportunity to help mm. and there's a lot of um strong evidence in psychology of helping others being a very strong for people's mental health and well-being in fact um one of once you have your immediate needs covered um and you've kind of got your basics down pat it's one of the best things you could be spending your time and money on uh yeah. for improving your own welfare is to focus on improving the welfare of others and so while there are moments when you kind of if you you're hit <laughs> with the, the you know um the scale of problems in the world um you know it, that's a healthy and reasonable human response but then channeling that and saying okay what can I do and the great thing is if you are using at least some of the best tools available to us like science and reason and logic and you know trying really hard uh, to work on these problems and finding better answers then you can take solve a bigger chunk of the things that you might want to uh, solve and that's that's emotionally very inspiring to be able to go well okay I care but 
I can do more good than I would have if I didn't think about this in a bit more detail. Yeah. Now you run a charity, but you're also separate. I I feel like you're very separate from the people that you're helping, although you are helping a lot. So Mm -hmm. do you, do you think you feel as if you are doing good for the world in the same way as you might, if you were working on a soup kitchen or something like Mm. that? Yeah. So there's definitely less immediate in your face, emotional reward. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be honest, a lot of the emotional reward that I see is um, broken into two parts. One is I've internalized a lot of um, kind of more abstract ideas of impact emotionally. So mm-hmm. when I see that you know you've uh, that there's been a distribution of bed nets that we helped you know, contribute a lot of fundraising for and things like that, for me I, I kind of go ah. Oh, that is incredible. Like I know that's going to improve lives and, you know, I can literally, I imagine, you know, people that are able to go to school and go to work and everything like that because they're not sick and dying and things like that. Um, And, and that, you know, is kind of tied intellectually, emotionally together. And the other one is actually seeing um, people in uh, the community that I'm serving of uh, donors who uh, seeing their emotional response to going, oh, I feel I I can make progress on some of these things that I care about. And I have support and I have a path forward and seeing them getting satisfaction and meaning and purpose from being able to help others and feel like they're, it's not a waste of their time and money because they've got you know stronger footing than if they were just guessing. Um, I think that's also very emotionally rewarding as well. Yeah, so... Let's say you're a you're a CEO type or you're an entrepreneur mm-hmm. or or just a high earner and you have you spend a lot of time at work, but still you want to give some of your money to charity. What would you say is the best way to assess the best charities for you uh, and and your your goals and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, how would you find them? How do you figure it out? Yeah, so the first question I often have would have people think about is what it is that they value. So as we just discussed before, you know, are you trying to improve lives now in the future? Are you trying to do it for humans or animals? What's your risk appetite? Like, are you looking for something with really strong, robust evidence so that you know that your money wasn't wasted? Or are you trying to have as much impact as possible, but aware that you might fund things which aren't that impactful, like more like investing in startups versus blue chip companies. And once you kind of understand those things, it becomes uh, a lot easier to direct people to you know, what would be the most impactful way of living out those values. Um, and uh, in the case of donations, uh, in global health and poverty, as I mentioned, uh, can be incredibly impactful for humans alive today. GiveWell, the charity evaluator who we partner with, they have incredible information and resources on that. Similarly, if you care about animal lives, uh, animal charity evaluators as well as a few other organizations that we refer to have a lot of good work on that Um, and we also have a combination of uh, different uh, charity evaluators and grant makers and and original research that we link to on our website as well for people who care about the long-term future and the things you can be doing to uh, help ensure that that's as good as possible um, with charitable donations today. So yeah, we have a lot of information on our website and, and a lot of that refers to people who are also doing a lot of good work in the space. What are some of the riskier, you mentioned some of the startups, that, or some of the, you mentioned some of the charities are quite risky and they might not pan out in the future, but obviously they might, they may well pan out and deliver yeah. results. So what are some yeah. of those? So an example of that is say, if, if, we, if we look at global health again, you could do something like, spend money on bed nets uh, through something like Against Malaria Foundation, which is like really solid evidence that you know exactly you need a a distribution in the Congo in two years time. It's going to cost $30 million and you're going to be giving $5,000 and that's enough. that will probably save one person's life and protect you. Um, you know, 20 or 30 people from malaria for three years or whatever, whatever those, you know, numbers might be. Um, don't remember off the top of my head. But then you've got something like uh, you might be trying to 
eliminate uh, environmental lead exposure. Um, there's a charity that one of our members has started, uh, the Lead Exposure Elimination Project. And they're early stage, they're only a year into this. Um, they don't have the kind of robust evidence of something like Against Malaria Foundation. They're working on policy solutions. So they're going in, they're testing to see if there is environmental lead in an, in an area and where it's coming from, whether it be paint or spices or all these other things. Um, and then they're giving that information to the governments and trying to help them get regulation and, and monitoring in place. Um, so it's a very different approach. It's your know, policy, it's uh, it's brand new, there's not a lot of evidence for it yet, but there's a lot of good first principles. You know that there is like a huge amount of lead exposure in the world that uh, has gone neglected, um, that we forget about in rich countries, um, and there and we know how terrible that is uh, for you know cognitive function among other things, um, and increases crime and all these things as well, uh, you know, developmental problems, and you know that re regulation has worked in and monitoring has worked in places, so it's a really good bet. That it might work but you have no idea whether it's going to be 10 times 100 times better than bed nets or one tenth as good as bed nets mm. so it's an early stage thing and, and if you're willing to take that risk you could have an incredible impact as well uh, but it could also be less impactful so spices are implicated in the creation of oh my goodness yeah so uh I think it's turmeric or, or cumin is often I think it's turmeric is often lead is used to color it uh, oh, what? And so people are ingesting it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I wonder if that is, happens in first world countries as well. Am I uh, eating lead when I eat Indian food? <laughs> it'd be what? very unlikely uh, due to the monitoring and import controls that we have here. But depends, like, if you were not going through traditional, you know, channels yeah. uh, like obviously if you're buying it from Coles I'd be incredibly yeah. <laughs> incredibly shocked um yeah. but you know depending on your the supply chain there are definitely places in the world where um yeah there is lead is used in many many places still for many different uses that are no longer the case in many rich countries that would that would completely fuck up a country if if you had yeah. all the population eating lead you would have a drop in IQ you would have yeah. I mean that that's terrible like it's it's possible that just eliminating lead from the environment could raise the IQ of the country yeah. by ten points or something crazy. Yeah, and this is this is the thing that people. One of the objections I hear quite often is, um, you know, we shouldn't be giving people handouts, um, or that you know they should help themselves get out of poverty and th things like that that are kind of very uh, libertarian, um, you know. Uh, a view of you know, responsive everyone should take responsibility and you know, it's, um it kind of places a lot of blame on people for being poor which i uh, or you're know, unhealthy and things like that which i think is uh ridiculous but it's it's really it's re removing impe impediments to success like i think there is something to be said for people being able to take responsibility and, and kind of have that autonomy to, to build the life that they want but as we're seeing with covid you can't do that if you know, you're sick or unable to work because it's shut down or whatever it is, you know, if we have these problems that are solvable and we're, and we could solve these things at a population level or a community level, that enables entire swaths of people to be able to help themselves, uh, you know, to go to work, to go to school, to, you know, to be, you know, smarter and better educated and, and more economically successful. But you can't do that if you're, you know, have lead poisoning yeah. or you know, malaria or, 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 you know, mental health problems that would be, you know, treatable and things like that. It's, it's a lot harder, sure. But I think, I think the issue here there is that the, the pull yourself up by the bootstrap yeah. philosophy is useful in a context, but not every context. It's yes. not a rule that you want to implement everywhere. For instance, yeah. um, there's this famous brand of shoes in America called Tom's. And I know. When you, yeah, when you buy one pair of shoes from Tom's, they donate another pair of shoes to Africa or whatever. And it seems great, except the result of that is, is that there are very few uh, shoe makers in, this, in the African villages mm -hmm. that they donate to because they don't need them because they're given shoes by the Americans. Yeah. So you're actually it's kind of robbing, 
Yeah, yeah. you're robbing people of the ability to make, make good conservatives. Like it's yeah. And then yeah, and, uh, yeah go, on. go on. Oh, I mean that's that kind of plays into the to the white, I should say, like Western savior complex. Yeah. We're just we are giving people handouts then, and that's not really what we want either. Yeah. And that's that's why it is so context dependent. And the, the problem is when people assume that all charity is that. Um when charity is just voluntarily giving money or time to help others. Mm. And there are things that help and there are things that hurt and there are things that only help a little bit. Uh, there are things that help a lot. Yeah. And uh, and things that you know hurt are things like uh, giving things to people they don't need. We get this with um, with disaster relief as well, is people want to send stuff, um, physical goods to places um, that have been hit with a disaster. And often they're goods that people don't need. Um, and often they end up having now the cost of storing or disposing of these goods. Mm. Um, and when what they needed was other things, it would have been services, it would have been cash to you know rebuild their home or whatever it is. Um, and knowing what's needed is, uh, is really important. And that's why the baseline like is if you can't do better than just giving people cash, which you can, there are things that are better than giving people cash, but most things aren't even better than giving people cash. They're, and so if you can't do better than cash, give cash. Mm. And then if you can do better than cash through policy things, through like regional things like, uh, you know, eradicating malaria or schistosomiasis or something from a, from an area, do those things, uh, mm. but don't send stuff that people don't need that displace local workers and things like that. After I went to your house and it was after the bushfires and <laughs> I'm sure you remember this. You had, <laughs> You had so many. Can you can you tell the story of the of the Fouches? <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, so my wife is an organizer of a craft guild that um, was doing uh, uh, things for rescue animals uh, in the in the wild. So building, uh, knitting, um, and and crocheting and, and sewing things like uh, koala mittens and. Uh, kangaroo pouches for for joeys and uh, all of these things that you you can't buy but you need when you're rescuing wild animals um, and you know to start with before the bushfires there was 400 of them in this craft guild and they were, never had enough stuff um, and then the bushfires hit and the Australian uh, bushfires were in the media everywhere and uh, people found out that this craft guild existed and that these supplies were needed and they were needed, but only to a point. Uh, and so we inundated my house, it's full to the brim with these things of, you know, varying levels of quality, uh, if whether they could be used to this day, I, I still am like unpicking uh, <laughs> while watching TV, uh, unpicking some of the things that were made um, so that my wife could just use that as yarn to make other <laughs> things. Um, and th they had to have the cost of storing it and everything like that. And like, there definitely was some need, but the need, the supply uh, went far exceeded um, what was actually needed when it would have been helpful to give cash to, you know, uh, to improve communities or everything like that. But, all, but even at that point, um, the response was nowhere near uh, in line with um, what was needed. And then this cost was there to try and like deal with, you know, all of this stuff. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was quite a time to be stuck in <laughs> it, 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 trying to like survive. And again, this, and this thing is this generosity is really to be lauded and people really want this personal emotional connection um but we had people send towels from america to be used as fabric because i remember seeing 300 dollars to send some old towels to australia because they wanted to send physical stuff wow. um because they had somewhere on the craft guild that said you can use old towels to make you know joey patches and stuff like that so it's been 300 dollars in postage to come to us to send old towels to australia and i'm like this is <laughs> That's... yeah love and people want to be able to actually want to really applaud that um the fact that people want to act and like to generosity is a really good thing um uh, but th what we try to do is help people think okay you've got this generosity how do we channel that to the things that are really going to help
I think the best part of that story, uh, I think you told me at the time, was that you'd actually taken down the address uh, of of the postal service because you didn't want people giving anything else. And then a Canadian website reposted your address so more people could send it. That was the best. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you're right. It's it's all about it's all about redirecting the energy. Yeah, as, as and it also as comes as back to is this from the mindset of what helps beneficiaries most? Um, and we had a lot of people getting angry that, you know, the address had been taken down or that we weren't accepting more supplies. And because they were thinking, I want to feel good about helping. Um, and I want to, this sounds like a cool project. I'd love to make koala mittens. That sounds really cute. But like, yeah. um, and you're not letting me do this. And it was saying, look, your local animal shelter probably actually needs a bunch of things. Your local hospitals probably want um, toys, uh, like you can crochet uh, uh, things that um, newborns can hold on to um, when they're in the uh, um, incubators uh, and uh, that they won't choke on, that they can you know, comfort from. And there are all these craft projects you could do to help those nearer to you that don't have a huge postage cost to Australia and, and things like that. but. Again, there's this emotional response uh, that is intuitive. I see this big thing and I want to be a part of it, um, as opposed to the neglected things. And the neglected things are the things that you can often, often have the most impact on. Um, and so while, you know, if a plane crash killed a bunch of, you know, people, um, like we've seen this a few times, a plane goes down and it, it's in the news for weeks, there are investigations launched, there are, you know, fundraisers for the families and everything like that. But, you know, every hour a plane load of people are dying from something like malaria that's, you know, completely preventable. And that's the thing that you've got to remember is there are things that we can do every day that really help improve lives a lot. Um, and because they're so commonplace, they're not news. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the human mind works. I mean, yeah. we're, we, there is that one study about empathy. And mm. I think if you would, if you saw a child in a poster and it had a, a write up on the child, you were really likely to give money to this charity because mm. even if the charity, and you knew, even if the charity helped the entire village, just seeing a poster of this child was the most likely thing to get you to give money. And then if it was two kids, it was a little less. If it was a, a picture of the whole village, you're like, fuck them, I don't care. Like, but just because we we don't have the emotional capacity to process mm -hmm. the, to, to kind of um, give ourselves a, a picture of, of what a village full of people feels and thinks and cares about and not mm -hmm. to mention an entire country or a continent like we just can't emotionally process that so we only are really evolved to care about people nearby us or people mm -hmm. that we can see and touch and, and talk to mm -hmm. unfortunately yeah. yeah and i think that it's also just accepting the limits of our brains it's not built for certain things it's like you know and we've done this uh we, we've we've kind of benefited from this evolutionary process and then said, thanks evolution, I'm done. I'm gonna do my own thing now. Like we've done that with birth control, <laughs> you know, with yeah. glasses. Like we've yeah. got these things where you go like, okay, this is built for certain things, uh, but I'm going to go you know, stand above what my evolved brain is telling me to do. Um, I'm going to find a hack around it. And that you know, relates to other things like, there, we have these moments of moral clarity where we go, actually, I don't think it's reasonable that I only care for people who are immediately in front of me. Mm. Ultimately, I really believe that all lives are valuable mm. and that if I can help more, that that's better than helping less. And so I'm going to take an action now that is sustainable and uh, I don't have to make that decision every day. And that's why, so given what we can, we have... Um, uh, the Giving What We Can pledge where, uh, you know, 6,000 plus people have said, look, I'm just going to give 10% of my income for the rest of my life. So wow. I'm not going to have to make that decision. I'm going to say, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and say, you said 10% of my income to the most effective charities. Um, and many people have found that it's a useful way to saying, I could give more, um, but 
I don't know if I would sustain that. And, uh, and I like might morally believe that I should give to the marginal dollar, which it might help others, uh, might uh, need to spend it on myself more than others. But I need to find a sustainable amount that's meaningful that really says, I actually care. I, I really care. But I'm going to do a lot more than nothing. I'm going to do a lot more than, you know, average. Um, but I can't, I can't rely on myself to decide every day to pull some money out of my pocket and, and give it to the most effective charity to, and have that be a conscious decision. Yeah. But what I can do is kind of set and forget in a sense and just get the positive, uh, I, you know, consequence of knowing that I've made a decision, which I can like really stand by and really believe in. That's incredible. 6,000 people. That's, mm. that's so many. 10% is a crazy amount of your wealth to be giving away. Yeah. I mean, it, for a lot of people, it's like a few takeaway. It's like takeaway every night or something, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's huge. So how do you actually set this up? I mean, is there a way, do you have like a subscription model that just takes the money out of their account or like, how do you set up exactly 10% to be given to you? Yeah. So uh, many, uh, many people, Taking, taking the pledges separate to um, giving the money. So it's a promise that you then make good on. Mm -hmm. um, many people can use uh, effective altruism funds, which is integrated with uh, giving what we can. And they can set a monthly amount and they can pick the charities or they can just go at a cause level and get a grant. I'm just going to give, you know, $500 a month is equivalent to 10% of my income. And I'm going to give you know, half of that to help people who are alive now and then split the difference between helping animals and helping people in the future. And then trust, you know, expert grant makers to help that make sure that money is used most effectively. Or they might go, I'm going to have, you know, this go to this very effective charity that I have done a lot of research on myself. Um, and that's how they might make good on it. Uh, that's a lot of members uh, do that in the UK and the US because uh, uh, that's part of the Centre for Effective Altruism, our parent organisation, which is tax deductible in those countries. For people in Australia, many people will use uh, Effective Altruism Australia to um, regret to highly effective charities in global health and development. Um, so we really leave it up to our members as to how they do it. We're trying to make it easy for people to um, do it a bit more automatically. So we're building a donation facility to our website over the next year um, to make it easy for people to not just track their pledge but also make the donations as well. Mm. Um, many people also do things like workplace giving. When I was uh, working at a previous company I set up workplace giving there just so I could have the money come out before I even see it and mm. I've, I've even sometimes had an account set up where I get you know, a certain portion of my salary put into a, a, another bank account that I created. And once a year, I kind of open it up and go, okay, where am I going to give this money? <laughs> yep. uh, there's, there's an app, like, I forget what it's called. It's called, it used to be called Acorns. Um, yeah. But essentially, it's just, you round up your money to the nearest dollar, and then you invest it, I think. Mm -hmm. But I, so I, I mean, there, that means that there is the possibility of making an app that you could mm -hmm. download. I don't know if it even exists now, but that you could just link it up to your bank account, and then mm -hmm. it would see how much you have coming in and then donate 10% of that right off the top. Yeah, we're speaking with uh, an organization founded by two of our members uh, called Momentum, uh, which does things like that, like uh, offers people to round up donations um, and tries to do a really good job of, as we talked about before, that emotional connection. So if they, uh, every time they have rules, like every time I buy a coffee, I can give to a water related charity or every time, um, I get my income, I could set 10% to go to this giving profile. So we're looking, we're working with them to see if we can um, build some bank integration. The problem uh, with this is we're an international community and both uh, charity law in, in countries varies significantly mm. and banking systems. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something we're working on to make it more automated for people. Um, but it is no small challenge technically <laughs> what uh what what did you say was the fun uh it was a workplace charity thing so it takes 10 percent without you even seeing it also? yeah so most people can actually just say to their employer um uh that I, they want to set up workplace giving um where you can say hey i want to set up uh, and i did this when i uh was um working at a previous company, I said, I want to give to Effective Altruism Australia, which uh, works with the charity value to give well to find the highest impact charities that 
help people in global health and poverty. Mm. Um, and, you know, I just said, hey, you know, 10, I think it was at the time I was maybe doing actually more than that, um, 10% of my income, just put it, give it there. You know, yep. <laughs> I'm never going to see that money. And it comes out pre-tax, so you don't have to like do the whole claiming tax back for deductions later and things like right. that. Um, and I started giving when I was in my early 20s, uh, kind of first jobs after university. And the thing is, if you if you give regularly, and especially if you can set, give before you get your income, um, you don't notice the money because you just never saw it. And yeah. it's great too if you pair it with uh, a promotion or you know, next time I get a promotion, I will give half of the difference. So I might say I go from you know, earning $60,000 to $70,000. Well, I'll take $5,000 and I'll give the other $5,000. And you you notice a marketable, you know, a market increase in your income, but you don't notice that you've also just like given a bunch. So all you get is the positive feeling of I'm just giving more money. <laughs> oh, you get that. You get that giant <laughs> smile on your face. That's where it comes yeah. from. <laughs> um, um, yeah. And then you can also uh, you can also get down a tax bracket if yeah. <laughs> uh, you're a little too high. Yeah. Um, and the really interesting thing is the research on both income and happiness and um, and giving is that once you hit about median uh, or mi middle to high income in rich countries, your the impact of income on your happiness really, really plateaus. Yeah. Um, and many people will notice this if they've kind of reflected on their own life and they you know, looked at other people around them, that once most of your basic needs are covered, other than, you know, reference class uh, comparison, thinking about, oh, you know, such and such have a nice new place with a pool and I wish I had that and things like that. Um, other than that kind of mental comparison that we do, which surprise, surprise, we never stop doing. Yeah. So if you go up in income $10,000, you'll just start compa comparing to richer people. So yeah. like, yeah. it, um, our Three billionaires has, are just comparing yeah. themselves to other billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from a material sense, um, income has really limited impact on happiness once you have most of your needs met and you know and no longer stressed about money and part of not being stressed about money is also just reducing your spending and and having predictable you know expenses and things like that it's actually more financial hygiene than it is uh wealth um and once you are in that position not only does it not improve your own uh, happiness very much but the other thing is there is a lot of research showing that money uh, is spent on, on helping others has really, really strong returns on our you know, well-being. Mm -hmm. um, also time as well. It's just this, it's an outlook shift that if you are someone who gets your emotional well-being and life satisfaction from working on projects that improve the world and you know, um, you you're going to be a happier person than mm -hmm. if you're someone who's focused on well, I need to get the next you new know, nice new big TV and oh, such and such went on holidays to you know Greece and they went to this nice. I, I I wish I did that. And then, yeah, you know, yeah. It's just a completely different mindset. Yeah. Some of the happiest rich people I know now that you say that are just all about giving. Like yeah. they're either, you know, I know one lady who's um actually a family member of mine, very wealthy mm -hmm. and lovely person, but she's always like giving money to local businesses. And mm. I think she knows, I mean, the way we've talked about it, she kind of knows that maybe there's not a huge chance of her getting a return or her succeeding, mm. but she's just trying to like sponsor local businesses, help people who are doing well. And then I just talked to Ben Chiarelli last week and mm. his he spends hours a day like talking to people who are kind of below him on the social ladder, just like hooking them up with other people or mm. uh, just helping them in any way he can. And it just seems like, giving your time and an effort towards other people is the best way to have happiness yeah and it's a beautiful thing about human psychology is that the thing that made humans very successful as a species is our cooperation mm. and that we have this pro-social drive uh to help others and that the beautiful thing is like even you look at an economy the fact that uh we're able to I'm able to buy something 
online and know that it's going to show up there's a trust involved um and trust is a pro-social behavior um and there are many things that are only possible because we have this we kind of default to pro-social behavior um and it's something that benefits everyone Mm. because you know if you make a positive connection between two people that costs you very little but that could be an amazing job opportunity for someone that improves their life significantly or a, or a new partner that someone meets or whatever it is. Like yeah. the, the upside is so much bigger than the cost in many cases. So long as you're being emotionally healthy and you're not uh, self-sacrificial to a point of detriment, um, you know, the upside of helping others it, it is incredible. And on top of that, we reward that. So who do you want to spend more time with in your life who do you want to do favors for people who you see being helpful yeah absolutely i wonder if this is actually uh kind of solving the meaning crisis that a lot of entrepreneurs have like they get to the top they're making millions and suddenly they realize they say like is this it is this all i have and they're just depressed i wonder if i wonder if the way to solve that oftentimes is just helping others yeah and um that's certainly been something that I've seen um, both in this role and in my uh, many years in the workforce and in my social interactions is, uh, you know, that that's where people find meaning. Um, And even, and I've seen this within the business world as well, that when people are working on businesses that they feel are helping people as well, like their actual work is very valuable. Um, They're, much more you know emotionally happy and and, you know and and driven and more likely to succeed because they're sitting there going well it's not about just me and my you know value of my shares or something like that it's going I'm actually really making a difference um and I want to keep doing that I want to see that um when I was at Sendal, which I was one of the first employees at and uh, worked at for the first few years, um, actually before it was even Sendal, uh, the, the things that were really meaningful to me were helping small businesses um, mm-hmm. and being uh, entirely carbon neutral, in fact, carbon negative, um, because I cared that if we were in an industry that um, you know, people were delivering packages and everything like that. Transportation is quite a big uh, emitter. There's, you know, if we succeeded and we grew that business and we're taking out, you know, a bigger market share out of, you know, something like Australia Post, um, you know, our success would mean that more small businesses are doing well and more carbon is not going to the atmosphere. So tying the the business metrics to the social mission I think is a really strong way for people to be motivated and the other thing is I knew that um, at some point when my shares are liquid I committed to giving a big chunk of that to some of the charities which I think are going to be most impactful as well so I was like if this is financially successful I then also get to see other things that I care about um, through the mode of charity Um, and that was very uh very good both emotionally and, and to keep me driven uh, to, to, to see the success as well. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. What drove you into being so involved in charity? Yeah, so I think the, it was quite formative uh, in my childhood. When I was, I think, about eight years old, I remember for the first time realizing that many people weren't as fortunate as me. I was by no means like super well off. I was kind of middle income family in Australia. Dad was an academic, mum was a um, full-time parent. We never went on expensive holidays or anything like that. Um, But it was realizing that there were people who were my age on the other side of the planet who for just due to lack of birth had you know, vaccine pre- preventable illnesses uh, who were, weren't getting the same education, who may not have uh, a roof over their head following a cyclone, you know, destroying their house and not no ability to kind of easily build that back up. And that really shocked me. I was like, this, there is nothing 
nothing that I've done to have this privilege of mm-hmm. being in one of the richest countries on earth and um, <laughs> and a white male, <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, smart with, you know, parents who really invested. Um, and, you know, what what have I done to earn this? Nothing. And, and that was very challenging to me. Um, and I wanted to see that when I was, I wanted to have a different story to tell my kids that I just, that when I have kids, I, I want to be able to say, I contributed to making this less, you know, unequal and, and that you're being born into a world which is better than the one that I was born into. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big, big thing for me. It was kind of that childhood uh, realisation. I then got very involved in things like uh, 40 Hour Famine, which I uh, participated in and ended up organising for my school and church and things like that. I was involved in Make Poverty History. Um, and then it, it kind of when I was in my 20s, I realised that uh, I also grew up on a, I grew up on a small farm and uh, very much a hobby farm. And while it was hard for me when uh, we had to take our pig, who was one of my favourite pets, to the abattoir, I still had the, at least the knowledge that he lived a good life. Um, but when I discovered that the animals in most farms didn't have the same conditions, um, that was also very confronting as well. And going, you know, I knew firsthand how social and, you know, loving, you know, these farm animals can be. They're very much like domestic pets. Um, mm-hmm. and, fish, absolutely. Yeah, pigs are very intelligent social animals. Um, and no, the conditions that they're in, uh, that they live in are, are terrible. And so, so what, death is one thing, but living with suffering is, is another. So around that time I went vegetarian um, and I uh, also you know, started looking into uh, charities for animal welfare and things like that as well. Hmm. That's so interesting. I, um, hmm. yeah, I, uh, I actually did, I didn't know that pigs in Australia don't have good lives. Mm-hmm. Like I, I kind of just assume that, we have so much space i kind of just assume that pigs would have pretty good lives here like i know Mm. in the u.s there's there's all sorts of stock farming and they're put in those tiny cages but Mm. uh is that is that true for for livestock in australia as well so australia is better than the u.s on on most farmed animal welfare that being said it still has some pretty terrible practices um and it varies there's no blanket thing you can say, um, but it does vary significantly. We don't have a lot of protections mm. that we should have. Um, chickens have, and I had a lot of chickens growing up, um, chickens are really, really terrible conditions in most places in the world, including Australia. Um, and unless they are you know, free range and also what qualifies as free range uh, could vary significantly. Sometimes free range is their... 10,000 hens, um, you know, per, I can't remember the, per 100 yeah. meters squared or whatever it is, yeah. uh, uh, in, uh, and that, in a, in a shed, and that is going to be worse than caged in some cases because mm. they're freaking out and, you know, scratching each other and, you know, like, they're just, it's, you know, terrible. Um, whereas some free range is like the farm that I grew up on where they're, going around, you know, eating, you know, some worms from the, you know, yeah. uh, from the ground and you know, out in the sun and, you know, somewhere safe to go at night. Like, that's a very, that's a good, that, that could be a great life. Um, and that's very different. So, yeah. Mm. I think part of the reason why I don't look at all, I mean, I, there are all those movies out there on, uh, on Netflix about how mm. bad animals have it. And I think part of the reason why I just, kind of avoid them is because of all the guilt tripping. I really mm-hmm. feel like I'm being guilt tripped the entire mm-hmm. time. And I actually don't want that as a motivator. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder, I feel like, I feel like nowadays a lot of our, a lot of our attitudes are, or maybe not our attitudes, but mm-hmm. like a lot of people try to motivate others through like, you have all this privilege and mm-hmm. you have it so good. And it's, it's like, that's true, but I also, don't want 
guilt put on me for something I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if there's, and I think, I feel like uh, other people have this, have this sort of opinion too. And I feel like oftentimes it becomes reactionary, like, Mm. um, like refusing to listen to vegans because uh, they're doing so much guilt tripping that I actually, I actually hate them now. Other like otherwise, I might have listened to them or something. Mm. Um, yeah, and I wonder if there's a better way to um, kind of motivate people. Yeah, it's a tricky one because um, there is a combination of motivations that we have, and uh, we generally, uh, given what we can, um, I lean towards more kind of opportunity, positive mm. framing. It's like here's an impact you could have if you're kind of you can be part of building the world that you want to see and living up to your values. Um, And, uh, but sometimes these moments of, like you need to have an awareness of a problem, Mm -hmm. um, but to to recognize that it is a problem and that sometimes can be guilt inducing because, you know, uh, and, but it's what do you, what's the next step and how much do you then point towards solutions mm-hmm. and, and the solutions that are accessible. And I think it's a difficult thing with uh, veganism, for example, uh, is uh, I believe that vegans have the moral high ground. <laughs> I haven't been able to get there. <laughs> um, they don't have the physical high ground, but they sure yeah. have the moral. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I go to reasonable efforts. For me, switching out meat was actually reasonably easy. Um, so was milk uh, and eggs. Uh, cheese was the, the hard one for me. And I'm someone I would much rather say, um, do what you can and be happy with that. Find something that's sustainable and motivating. And then also focus on what makes the biggest impact. So morally speaking, um, you know, I care that I'm internally consistent and that gives me emotional well-being to say that I picked something I know that is achievable for me and mm-hmm. that makes me happy. And so for me going, okay, I'm satisfying. I'm going to be vegetarian and make other like conscious choices where I can, but not uh, reducing the amount of harm that my diet does. But I'm also going to give to animal charities that, um, and, and, buy products that are great alternatives things like the beyond burger and stuff like that to try and support uh the change that i want to see in the world and knowing that that's actually to some extent having a bigger positive impact on on net than the negative impact of me having the occasional egg or cheese or stuff like that um so there's kind of one is the what do i you know the the emotional well-being that I get from being consistent with my values in one sense. And the other is the more abstract, what is the impact of my actions? Mm. And the total impact of my actions, if I'm supporting things uh, that are improving conditions for animals in general, even if I'm still causing some small harm, uh, the total impact is positive. <laughs> and yeah. so yeah, I know people who still, you know, eat, um, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, meat on a, semi-regular basis uh who care a lot about animal welfare but they're trying to support improving conditions so mm. just the difference between and as i said the difference between free-range eggs like proper free-range eggs and cage eggs is just huge for welfare like um so it's perfectly reasonable to, to support the better alternative um than it is to opt out completely um, I admire people who can opt out completely, but I, I see this as akin to what we've done with, you know, giving what we can with just saying, hey, just pick it, pick an amount that you think is meaningful or sustainable that really is trying to solve the problems you care about and then focus on other things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that because philosophically, I would say that, you know, to the, I don't believe as far as the universe is concerned, you know, my welfare is more important than anyone else's. Um, but I can only have so much energy and time and like self-sacrificing ability and need to be sustainable and healthy. And um, and I'm the only one who's ultimately responsible for my own well-being as well. But what I, so I, I'm not going to give to the my, everything I possibly could, but I will give what I can um, mm-hmm. and what I can do in a sustainable way that I find mean, meaningful and motivating. Mm-hmm. It's interesting too. There's uh, humans have this kind of 
categorization thing that we mm. do a lot where it's like I'm vegan or I'm nothing <laughs> or I'm filth and, <laughs> and I, I think it, it doesn't need to be like that it could be yeah. like I'm vegan most of the time and sometimes yeah. I have an egg I have some cheese whatever it is yeah. and it's it, it's okay like it's you know yeah it's like, uh, I try to, I try to exercise every day. And then initially I, I had an injury and so I wasn't exercising for a while. And initially I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go outside and like pick up a weight for a little while, like five yeah. minutes, nothing. And then you slowly work your way up. And I think with giving what we can, it's like a lot of people, I think some people might be like, Oh, 10% isn't enough. And mm-hmm. so somehow in their mind, they twist it. So it's like, Okay, I'm gonna do forty percent, and then oh, I actually don't have any money this week, so yeah. I'm gonna do nothing, <laughs> and then nothing for three weeks, and then another yeah. like thirty, and um, yeah, so much mental energy, so much stress, and it's like if yeah. you just give ten percent consistently, then yeah. forget yeah. about it. That's that's huge. Yeah. It's a massive impact. And we we uh, so we also have what we call our try giving pledge, uh, which people can just use it as a tool to set any goal, but we encourage people to set a goal. So they can be like, I'm gonna give 2% of my income for the next year and then see what that's like mm. and and track that and be like, huh, you know, I felt good. Like, <laughs> and now I'm gonna try 5% or whatever. Or, and what we encourage people is just to make a decision to actually mm. be intentional and for that decision to be based on what is gonna be meaningful and sustainable. Mm. Um, and it's a tool. It's a tool to help people live up to their values. And and I I really take the view that you know we're living good lives if we're just being pragmatic about our kind of motivation and um, and abilities to do things uh, whilst striving for our personal best. Mm. So um, and you know knowing that there is a time you know for everything. Um, so that there are times in your life where you might be working really, really hard on a project to, that is really important to you. Um, and that that time, the most important thing you could be doing is, is working on that project. It could be you know, starting a new business or, um, you know, could be, uh, you know, working on uh, helping someone else to, to do something. Um, and then, you know, at that, when that's over, the most important thing you could be doing could be taking a holiday. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but when you come back and you know, things settle down, just having these moments where you go, give yourself time to reflect and go, what is it that you ultimately want to be doing in the world? And we can have different answers, but so long as we're mindful and, and intentional, I think it's a similar thing with, you know, having kids, like it's something that, I've done a lot of thinking about and discussed a lot with my wife. It's something we want to do, but it wasn't a default. It's something we're going to do uh, because it's expected of us. Similarly, we weren't going to go the opposite that you know, some people go um, because it is, you know, it was normal and expected. It's something I shouldn't do because it should, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like, well, actually, what what do we want? And, and, and what, what what's the impact it's going to have in our lives? What's the cost? Um, what does that mean for the world? What does it mean for us? What is it? The upside, you know, how would we raise them? You know, what type of uh, environment do we want to have? But it's being intentional. Mm. Yeah, being mindful. I talked to um, Harry Goldberg, a financial analyst, not too long ago, and he said that most people don't have a financial plan. That's like the majority of people that that come up to him, and it was astounding because most people like actually don't consider their futures in a way that I thought they would have. Mm especially people going to a financial analyst. They're not just people on the dole. They're probably people with, I don't know, with yeah. making decent money. So I think actually, if there's any takeaway, it's probably to do exactly what you just said and, and kind of be mindful about what your impact, what you would like your impact to be in the future. Um, so there's something that our sister organization, 80,000 Hours, uh, talks a lot about is, you know, you've got 80,000 hours in your career. Why would you not spend 1% of that thinking about what will be good for the world and good for you. Um, and, you know, 1% of 80,000 hours uh, is, you know, a decent chunk of time, but most people don't spend that much time thinking about their career. Um, mm. Similarly, if you're giving a decent chunk of money, um, I remember that was, a, that was when I actually discovered the whole field of uh, effective giving and effective altruism was in 2011. Uh, I'd gone from, you know, 
post financial crisis, you know, got a job, um, paid off debt from my savings disappearing when I had uni fees and everything like that. And my wife, um, partner at the time, finally got a job and I got a raise. And I was like, oh, now's the time that I'm going to start giving a decent amount because the whole hedonic treadmill, I can not notice it. Um, and I was like, but that is a decent amount of money. Like at the time I was, you know, earning $40,000 and I'm like, that's $4,000. That's a lot of money. Hmm. Um, it, I should probably spend more than just um, a couple of minutes deciding where this should go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what did you decide on? Um, eventually at that point I decided, um, uh, against malaria foundation was something I started supporting around then. And that was based off research of both giving what we can and give well, uh, they were both recommending it around then. Hmm. I hear um, that one of the most effective dollar per dollar. Yeah, it's also, it's, it's, it's definitely up there. It's one that was really robust. And for me at the time, that was really important. Um, because I, I was more worried about it not being a waste of money. Mm. that um and that i had really good evidence to believe that it was a good spend then i was taking the lens that i'd be willing to take a bit of risk uh and like potentially really high impact but with lower probability mm. um and yeah it's such a big problem that uh we forget about in rich countries uh who have i think australia it was malaria was wiped out in the 50s um and even then it never had the, the stronghold that it had in some places yeah my favorite, I, I actually don't think it's a charity, but I really like the Ocean Cleanup Project. Do you know them? I uh, know, I don't know them. Oh, they're cool. Sorry. There's a guy boy on slot. He's, he's my age. He's, um, he'd be 27 now. And mm -hmm. you've probably heard of him on random social media pages, but uh, when he was 16, he went scuba diving and he saw all this plastic in the ocean. And so he created this structure to take plastic out of the ocean, essentially. And now he does it in rivers as well, too. And there are these giant floating barges and plastic floats and so it just collects them and all the fish swim under like you don't you just don't catch any fish mm -hmm. um and he's doing this really interesting thing where he's uh taking the plastic and then making it into things like glasses so you can't use all of the plastic but some of it you can and then he sells mm -hmm. the glasses for like 300 dollars each and people get <laughs> they get to like virtue signal i mean that's kind of a dirty word but it's like they get to signal that they've supported this great charity and they're kind of making money back and uh and so and i, I like um i like microloans as well i mean do you know you know what microloans are yeah yeah my wife used to work in an organization oh, that's that. awesome just okay do you want to explain what they are really quick i'm sure you know yeah so microloans um the way you instead of donating money you give money as a loan um and or you do donate it but it's uh loaned out um and then given back and kind of reloaned. Um, so this is uh, a bit less um, of uh, effective as it was really early on. Mm -hmm. So what the main the main advantage of micro loans is, and these are like loans of what would be fifty Australian dollars, um, could it could be a decent amount of money for someone. And typically they would spend it on something which has uh, ongoing benefits so for example buying a more efficient stove that means that, that they have less uh, health uh you know downside of you know burning something which is going to be bad for their health but also that they buy spend less on buying fuel for that stove mm -hmm. um so you improve health and uh, and you improve um economic conditions because they are buying an asset in a sense um similarly like replacing a thatch roof with a metal roof um so that when a hurricane hits uh you don't have to constantly replace the thatch roof because the metal will withstand it um so you know several decades ago access to financial services uh in low-income countries was really really limited and you know, basic financial services can allow you to do things like that. They can help you improve your own living conditions. Um, now, the main difficulty with uh, microloans now is that they are not, like people really like the one-to-one -one connection. Like I loan to this person in this place. That's quite expensive to, um, to administer so it's spent a lot of time to get a photo and a story and mm -hmm. uh, and all that stuff uh for a 50 dollar loan um 
And the other thing is uh, it, sometimes it's just more efficient to just give people give people cash and have no expectation that they will pay it back. Um, if they're spending it on things which are going to be incredibly great investments for their life and well-being as well. Um, so, uh, and the third thing is that a lot of these financial services now do exist. Uh, and they're kind of being, in, so the charity side of it is less necessary than supporting local institutions that do provide these financial services. And that's actually the, the, some of the best work that the charity that my wife used to work at uh, was doing is they're actually financial education and and getting kind of providing seed capital in a sense for and, and infrastructure for these local financial institutions to get set up that then lend out on decent terms and stuff like that. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. In Actually, fact, providing savings accounts is a huge benefit more wow. than anything. Yeah. I wonder if potential investors would be, uh, <laughs> would have a, have good returns if they invested seed into yeah. impoverished countries uh, providing financial services. Yeah. The difficulty is that um, these, they're often t- tend to be more successful when they're set up as not-for-profit enterprises or the external capital coming from places like Australia uh, get, uh, is given, not uh, invested, because uh, the expectation of return um, being kind of better than market returns and things like that mm. can cause things like interest rates to rise for the end bit recipient and things like that that we see, you know, um, that some things can start to become extractive um, and, and, and problematic. Um, mm. So, you know, sometimes uh, businesses uh, or for-profit business may be the best solution to things and sometimes it's not. And I think it's a, often a case-by-case basis. Mm. My impression of microloans is actually slightly different to what you described. Mm. Um, it, okay. was, it was uh, the ones that I looked into were just micro business loans. And so okay. yeah. I don't business know if they were the same or not, but it was like, you let you, you give someone a hundred dollars to buy like a couple of goats and mm. then they produce the milk and sell the meat and then pay it back. And then the money gets kind mm. of paid forward or like a yeah. sale machine or something. Yeah. Yeah. So s- similar. So yeah, sometimes it's either income producing asset or a uh, cost reduction asset. Oh, yeah. um, so same, 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 really. Yes. And often it's the same institutions that provide both. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah I yeah. suppose if uh, if it was a not-for-profit kind of financial service, you would have a lot less selection criteria. Like you wouldn't be screening some old mother of five to <laughs> so to see if she could pay back your loan. You would kind of just give her the money, hopefully. Yeah, the interesting thing is too um, that uh, a lot of these uh, ones are mutual women's credit union type things uh, mm-hmm. because... Uh, <laughs> women have been shown to be much more reliable to uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in microfinance. Yeah. Well, how so? What's what's the difference between women and men in terms of lending money to them? Uh, just the spending habits. Um, and you're much more likely to spend it on things. Uh, sometimes it's like the, it helps them be economically productive when they may not have been in some cases and other times it's you know spending on things like their child's education and things like that um mm-hmm. it's also sometimes having the external um uh the external party to say look hey this this money isn't just ours to be spent on anything this is for this thing um but yeah I, i'm not an expert in this field so I, i'm mm-hmm. careful to not talk outside my expertise <laughs> yeah that's fine um so for any kind of entrepreneurs listening, I'm, I'm wondering what real hiccups that you have in your field, in the field of, uh, of, of kind of charitable giving. Do you have any like thorns in your side that people could help you solve? Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know if this is something people could help me solve, but the biggest thorn on my side is, as, as we've discussed, helping us find that emotional connection uh to make a rational decision (laughs) um and uh that's something we're looking at um from an entrepreneurship side of things uh there are things that i would recommend a lot of entrepreneurs look into like um an organization that we have a lot of uh mutual interaction with is founders pledge uh, and i'm a member of founders pledge as well uh and they say uh it's it's a way that 
entrepreneurs can say, I'm going to focus on my business for years to come, but when I get to a liquidity, liquidity event, that's what I want to give. Um, and they build a community around that and they help advise as well on, on projects that they could give to that would be highly impactful. If you're an entrepreneur, I highly recommend checking out Founders Pledge uh, as well. The other thing is for entrepreneurs is there are understanding what are some of the biggest problems before you are starting a business. So if you're in that pre-idea uh, stage, um, there are a few lists floating around that I would have to look at, see if I can find again. Um, but some of these big problems that we're facing in the world, particularly kind of long-term uh, problems like emerging technologies, um, that you really want good people who are thinking about the consequences of these things being the ones working on it. For example, um, I'm really glad that OpenAI uh, and uh, and um, a few other organizations in that space have AI safety teams on their team. So, and they have things written into, uh, I think it's OpenAI, that they have their model is we will have a maximum return off this. Uh, if it turns out they get incredibly mm -hmm. successful um, and they have transformative artificial intelligence that could make a lot of human work uh, redundant or at least a long transition period where they're trying to figure out which things aren't as, as replaceable. Um, once they've all made you a know, hundred times their initial investment, then the rest of the money uh, is going to go into a fund to uh, just improve the world. I can't remember exactly the details and if it is open AI, but re thinking really about what if I am successful, what does that look like? How will I use that success? And the other question is, what problems am I, am I working on? Mm. Am I working on big problems that we could really make a big impact on? Or am I, you know, fiddling around the edges, exploiting a, a small market that, um, you know, isn't adding as much value to the world. Mm. And that makes a lot of sense. And joining a founders fund is probably an excellent place to market with with nice, genuine people. Mm. Like, I mean, I uh, I guess for me, when it when it comes to charities, I maybe I think of like how could I guess I think about this a lot when I think about charities. It's like how could a charity either become self sustaining and make its mm. own money, or how could a charity help the people that is that are giving to it. And something like a, like a founders group is a great idea because you have a collective of people and network and then they're all kind of dedicated to helping other people and just kind of racking up good karma. And so mm. you're just constantly connecting with great people and ultimately giving to causes, which is exactly mm. what we want. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think that generally if you surround yourself with people who have similar values or values that you want to hold, um, you adopt a lot more of that and you are able to live that better. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I found incredibly fulfilling is having a lot more people in my life that care about improving the world um, motivates me to do so as well. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot more people who are taking the lens of <clears throat> what are the consequences of my actions, uh, both short-term and long-term, and you know, how do I help others in, in what I'm doing? Um, it inspires you to see other people doing it. It kind of validates decisions you're making, helps you kind of form your identity, give you that kind of positive. We're very social animals. We kind of very uh, take cues from those around us. And it's like, if you want to get fit, one of the best things you can do instead of you know, signing up for a particular, uh, you know, program is to have someone who is just a bit more fit than you are and more motivated in your life who's likely to do an activity with you that you both enjoy. <laughs> I joined up at jujitsu and I made friends with the jujitsu people. And when I don't show up, they're like, where were you? Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's great. <laughs> It's awesome and I'm going like four or five times a week and my friends are like four or five times a week and I was like oh I, I didn't even realize that was a lot it's just yeah. you know what we do it's great yeah exactly and it's the same like you know one of my good friends uh you know didn't do a lot of physical activity except for skiing which was only occasionally on holiday 
um, and he was struggling to find something and we started enjoying climbing and then he and I were climbing heaps together and it was that social motivation that you're going to do something you enjoy with someone you like and it go, it's a difference between being active or not um, and yeah it's similar with other things if you want to if you ultimately really care about improving the world and you know that that's going to improve your well-being but you are surrounded by people who are not on board with that it's going to be really hard to maintain that motivation. Yeah, absolutely. Tim Ferriss says uh, you're the product of the five people you spend the most time around. Yeah. And I, mean, I think one of the best things you can do is like look around you. <laughs> who's who's around you? What are they telling you? Yeah. Um, and also, I, I mean, this is a this is a harsh reality to speak of, but like I found that when I cut people out that weren't bringing me up in some way, and it doesn't have to be in exactly the way that I, you know, I have a friend who's super. He's, he's obese, but he's like working on losing weight. You know, he's going through uni, he's doing all these things. And it's like, well, then he's pointing upwards. So that's fine. That's good. But if people are like pointing downwards, if they're dragging you down, if you, if you say, no, I don't want to drink. And they're trying to like pressure you to drink, you know, it's um, ultimately, I think when you get rid of those people, uh, you make room for others in your life that are, are, are better or more positive influence for you. So. And it's also the, therefore important for us to think about the things that we're the behavior that we're modeling as well for the people around us like are we that person who is saying oh you should have another drink um because I have we're it, feel- for sure yeah <laughs> because we're that. feeling bad about the fact that we're having the drink and the other person isn't yeah and this, this is a common thing that we know that we'll all catch ourselves doing um and back to the conversation you were saying earlier about uh uh when someone is vegan it can just be challenging to your um what you're doing and sometimes our response to someone doing something which we might have some level of admiration or desire to be like or do but we're not doing Mm. can challenge us and the response to that instead of kind of applauding them and maybe trying to update more towards their behavior we can put them down for it or try to bring them down to our level (laughs) and um and to catch ourselves doing that it can be confronting, um, but it can also be that confrontation can be helpful to, to realize yourself, is this who I want to be? Do I want to be pointing people, bringing people down or do I want to be bringing people up or, or at least coming up to other people's levels? That's such a good point. Uh, is my anger towards someone else actually guilt towards myself? That's mm-hmm. a great question. <laughs> I think, yeah, more often than not, I think it's probably true. Maybe even all the time. I'm not sure yeah when certainly was- certainly more than people realize and and this is something i found quite interesting with certain practices like um mindfulness uh meditation um journaling uh, including gratitude journaling um things like that have been very helpful in noticing your own thoughts mm. and noticing your orientation um and it's the first step in changing anything is noticing and then wanting. <laughs> um, and if you notice that when someone challenges me in certain ways and I respond in ways that I don't want to, I then feel bad about myself. That can motivate you to change how you respond mm. or change your behavior or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even noticing is sometimes really difficult. I'm reading this book, mm. Action Inquiry, and it says... Uh, one of the exercises it suggests is notice the change you feel when you move from one activity to another. How do you feel that, about that activity you just did? And how do you feel about the activity that you're moving towards? And it said, um, and if you don't notice the moving, you know, maybe you might not notice any actions for an entire day. And that means that you haven't really been mindful of this task for the entire day. And I'm I'm not like until you just mentioned it, I I haven't even been paying attention at all. Like, so I kind of set an intention to be mindful of this thing. um, And I absolutely haven't been. And I think just the challenge of noticing your own thoughts is huge in itself. Just that act is, can be life changing. So uh, what's next? What's next? Yeah. For Luke Freeman. Um, well, surviving lockdown in Sydney uh, <laughs> is uh, certainly uh, one of the things. Um, uh, giving what we can, we're 
hiring several roles at the moment, which is quite exciting. Um, so hiring a researcher, a head of content uh, to help grow our community and, and improve the quality of advice um, and resources that we give people. Um, and as I mentioned, some technical things as well, which I'm very excited for, you know, building a, a better digital product to make it easy for people to give more, give more effectively. Um, I'm throwing myself into uh, rollerblading a little bit <laughs> to get through uh, lockdown and looking forward to when that ends to be able to climb again and play music. Um, yeah. So that, and especially with you, come yeah. at, at Stave's Brewery and uh, have a big sing-along. Oh, it'll be so nice. Yeah, Luke runs a really cool ukulele group. <laughs> Fantastic. There were like, when I went, there were like 10 people there or something playing. Maybe, yeah. maybe not many, but there were 20 people in the room, like all singing along. That was great. Yeah. That was so fun. I really miss it. Yeah. <laughs> There's something so human about playing music with other people and singing along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's magical. <laughs> so yeah. one of the flow state activities for me, actually. Oh. Um, and yeah, when you find those things, they're gold. Yeah, same time. Uh, when I play music, time like slows down. Like mm. I think it's been half an hour and it's been five minutes. I, I yeah. don't understand it at all. But I, I don't know. I don't know what happens. Yeah, that. particularly for me, it's playing music with other people. That's mm. the thing that really uh, does it for me. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's another language. It's like mm. the language of emotion. I think of it as. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> all right. I think I'll end it there. Thank you cool. so much for coming on. Thank you. That was great. That was um, fantastic. Yeah. I also, I have you published that other episode you were talking about? Uh, there were two that you mentioned of conversations you'd had um, with some entrepreneurs, I think. Um, yep. yep. Both of them. Ben Chiarelli and Harry Goldberg. I published them both recently. Great. Yeah. Uh, can you send them to me? I'd love to listen. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Excellent. I'll see you later, Luke. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye.